Hello and welcome to the Nausea Cast. The Nausea Cast is where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and discuss our analysis and research findings. Today we're going to talk about the 1994 film Pompoko directed by Isao Takahara. And if you don't want to watch the video version on YouTube, we always provide a download link in the description. Alright, first things first, this film has balls. Uh, yeah. You stole yeah, my joke. I was going to leave with that. Big, big hairy testicles. I was going to say, this is quite an ambitious <laughs> production. It's quite a ballsy movie as far as Studio Ghibli goes. But you know who else has balls? Everyone on this blessed podcast. First of all, we have Hipster Cthulhu. Yeah, that was me with the better jokes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> uh, then Plate on Skull. Um, I take no offense to that. I know my jokes are terrible. Um, look forward to discussing this uh, really sad family flick. Yes. And Tasu. I think my balls are retracting. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> don't. Don't be scared. <laughs> Man, aren't, aren't all testicles transforming in their own way? Mm. Like, Yeah. True. And also it depends on what you make of them, how you use them, right? It's not just that they're there. If anything, the lesson of this film is that balls are quite uh, versatile. All right. This film, as I already mentioned, is directed by Itao Takahata. So we're returning to uh, the wonderful filmmaker who brought us Grave of the Fireflies and Only Yesterday. And this time again, um, he has, as, had, as he had with uh, Omoi de Poro Poro, aka Only Yesterday, another wonderful uh, what would it be called? Onomatopoeia in, in the title, because the title Pompoko refers to a very cute thing, namely the drumming of the bellies that the tanuki do. Yeah, that's nice. I also want a belly drum like that. I was wondering, uh, what's, um, it, it has a longer title in Japanese, doesn't it? Yes, the full Japanese title refers to something along the lines, and before I try butchering the pronunciation, I'm just going to try to translate the translations I've read. Um, it refers to the, um, what was it? The Heisei era Tanuki War Pompoko. Am I getting that right? Yeah, something along the lines. Okay, so it yeah. refers to like a historical war to the Heisei area though, which is like contemporary with like the time frame the film depicts, which is, uh, as a side note, like a real time frame and a real place, namely referring to the suburbanization around Tokyo, specifically the Tama Hills area, which is, historically speaking, at the time of the film's making, I don't know if it has been replaced as that yet, but the biggest suburbanization, like reshaping of nature project in, I guess, not only Japanese history, but also like world history. Yeah, they, hmm. they say they do say so in the movie as well, that it was like the, the biggest um, urbanization project in the world. Right. The biggest and construction to, project. To recontextualize, this is like the 1960s, right? Yeah, it goes from the uh, 60s all the way to like, I guess, kind of the, the late 80s or like early 90s when the movie's kind of like being made and the whole Tama Hills thing has yeah, been exactly. finished. Hmm. The war is kind of ongoing throughout the entire process of the suburbanization of that area, which was re really quick and really brutal for the environment around there, leading also to some real life uh, I guess, eco-terrorism, which we're going to get into how the film speaks to this. Um, but not only the, I guess, um, the historical background of the Tama Hills have been drawn from reality, also the background art, then, because this film, again, like most uh, Ghibli films, has some very detailed and uh, explicit background uh, photography going on, like some research before it happens. And to that, that point, an interesting anecdote that I've read in one of my texts is that the art director of the film, uh, Oga Kazuo, um, said that like his team was out there regardless of the weather, like every other day, like to take some pictures of this dignity construction site amidst the natural habitats, because Takahata advised them that they would have in the uh, they in the film they would have to create scenarios that not only did portray like the natural homes of the uh, of the tanuki but also to create an effect that the audience like would feel sorry for the Tanuki to having to live in such an environment. But basically, it's, it's a Ghibli movie and the backgrounds are gorgeous watercolors for the most part. Um, and, and they actually like kind of um, are extra important in this uh, film compared to, to others, specifically because um, the environment is such a central part of the, of the film. Um, it's it's kind of cliche to say that like the setting is a character in and of itself, but like 
uh, in this case, it's almost the main character. Uh, the, the, uh, at least, like, the main, like, conflict point is the the woods, the hills, the, uh, the city, the town, um, and, and, and how the they people. gradually yeah. change. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would even go so far as to say that even the characters are more or less part of a setting. Like, you have this really big, huge ensemble cast of tons of tanuki, all, like, different names and, like, different attitudes. But ultimately, you get a very communal sense of the tanuki. And all the human characters in this film are, like, basically non-characters, I think, aside, like, from the the business uh, owner of the Wonderland uh, park later on in the film. No human character really receives any uh, screen time or attention beyond, like, a passing glance or something. Um, this is interesting to me in the way that rather than having a story which, for example, someone like Miyazaki would often focus on, but also Takahara with Only Yesterday, where we experience like a character's interaction with their surroundings and like their growth and change due to it and them mustering and rising up to the challenge, we have a kind of community tale about a kind of traditional community that is in conflict with another part of the setting, which is like the uh, westernizing of the society. So it is basically the setting that is not only the main story, but also the main character, the focal point of everything, because the setting is like the war that is being set up between the Tanuki and the uh, city is the, is the film, basically. <laughs> yeah, and I, I particularly like how this is like embedded into the structure of it as well, because um, I, I was saying this was ballsy, but it really is in the way that like uh, the <laughs> film is... Um, the, the way it's formatted is quite strange and like really out there for like just anime movies in general where it's like presented as like a faux documentary about like the history of the tanuki being displaced in the Tama Hills and it has like a, a narrator of course and like audio insert interview clips from the tanuki but then we also have these things that like constantly like break the flow of even the reality the bit where we see like the giant buddha lying on the hills like transforming the uh, environment oh, yeah, yeah. itself Mm-hmm. Like the the opening scenes sp- uh, specifically, like uh, um, opening a movie, you want to like uh, set the tone, set the expectations uh, for the viewer, and um, our expectations are set with first um, a uh, like a uh, story of like these actual like uh, t- Tanuki realistically animated um, that they have to uh, leave this uh, th- this house with a garden that was abandoned which is uh, getting demolished uh, and then get into conflict with another tribe of uh, uh, tanuki and then so- all of a sudden they turn into a war to to goofy looking japanese like war yeah, band like samurai movie yeah um which like like aren't even like and fighting seriously it's all being yeah not it's only it. like heavily coded like with japanese history and culture of the time very pressing matters is also as much coded with Japanese history and culture of the past, namely the tanuki embodying the uh, very classic folklore tale of like the mischievous uh, trickster type characters who roam around tricking people, transforming into all kinds of stuff, who are also like kind of like bumbling fools and just joy-seeking hedonistic kind of characters. Um, they are very present uh, front and center here alongside other uh, yokai uh, doing the parade and uh, the, the foxes or kitsune as they are also similarly transforming characters and so on, um, which led to an interesting moment or I guess aspect of this film. It is that it is kind of grotesque in many ways, like we would like we're joking about the balls. It is interesting to what an extent the ball sex of Tanukis are an actual folkloristic aspect of their trickster character. Like they, it, you can search for like Tanuki scrolls and images and drawings like from, from like the past 300 years and you will see them doing all sorts of mischievous stuff like with their balls, like completely and utterly absurd stuff even. Like, I don't know, like like make a boat out of your balls or like a like a weather balloon or a goldfish pond in the balls or like sl- hitting people with balls uh, as also happens in the movies so while it is goofy and grotesque to i guess our western sensibilities it is much more in line with like the folkloristic expectations that japanese people would already bring going into the movie about tanukis yeah and yeah, it, it would be like being weirded yeah. out that fairies have wings because people don't like like that's it's just part of the, their nature as like uh yeah as, as like spirits uh like folklore creatures 
Oh, well, what I find most interesting about this, though, is like the same applies to the uh, the magical transforming foxes as well. It's that like I think the movie like really gets at this as well, where it's like um, typically you have folklore stuff like fairies or like goblins or whatever that are like not a real thing. They're kind of an approximation of ideas told over time. But like the Tanukian foxes are real animals that like physically exist in Japan and they're like weird half in the magical world of transforming but also being like real animals as well kind of gives them this like special place they exist in and that's what the movie kind of gets at yeah absolutely the movie really puts us into this liminal space of like this this threatened i guess folklore character that has no place in human society but the place outside of human society is also gradually fading as is the same with like their transformation which clearly implies that they can switch between being an animal and being a man. They have this interesting perspective to them. And I think we're going to dig into that a little bit deeper a little bit later. But for now, just a really interesting thing. The English dub tried to solve the issue of the Tanuki balls and the uh, right, cultural yeah. <laughs> like, distance. Because what they did is they refused to call them Tanuki or what would be a more accurate translation, the raccoon dog. They called them just raccoons. And instead of calling it like the balls... Uh, it was the uh, raccoon pouch, which is really misleading because like, uh, <laughs> because this puts them in an entirely different species of animal now because they're now, now conflated with like mus... I, I can't actually pronounce yeah. this. Musupials, yeah. exactly. I do uh, typically uh, like the, uh, the Ghibli dubs, but I feel like Pompoko is such an incredibly Japanese movie head to tail that it's like, uh, it kind of like hard to ever translate it into English properly. And so I think it's probably one of the weaker ver like versions of dubs you can have. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, I think we talked about it before recording, but I, th I think this is like the the most culturally Japanese uh, film in the Ghibli canon. It's it's just so it's just filled with stuff that like uh, would will just go over he over the head of like uh, any yeah. Western viewer. And it's interesting because it's quite different into how like a film like uh, uh, um, 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 Spirited Away goes about the I guess invocation of Japanese culture, folklore, and yokai, because uh, just to have a brief comparison, in Spirited Away, we kind of take a step out of the direct uh, Japanese context, and we go into a sort of abstracted realm where all the things put, put there are sort of indirect references and allusions to uh, Japanese folklore, but not like explicit Whereas the Tanuki are not only grounded like in an expl explicit reference to folklore stories and like tales that are being told in the movie about the Tanuki, but like they're very much grounded in a history and an expectation towards the audience to be familiar with that kind of history to understand the Tanuki character as fully. And um, in this way, and we could actually see quite the remarkable difference in Western reception of the films because Pompoko in general is not one of the more famous or beloved films in the West. While in Japan, it has like one best picture award, like I think period in Japan of the year. Uh, whereas like they, uh, it wasn't even nominated for like an Academy Award, despite being like proposed as one uh, uh, submission that might be nominated. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't, uh, this is it, it, probably it was, not the best metric. So, so you're saying like it was uh, Japan's uh, official uh, like um, nomination to for consideration uh, for the international feature? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's that, that's that's a pretty big deal. Like within yeah. Countries. And then of course, Spirited Away would win the best foreign film, didn't it? Or did it win exactly. West? Win yeah. best animated. I don't remember. But either it, way, uh, it's the first uh, anime to win uh, any Academy Award. It won. Yeah. Uh, best well, there you go. Feature. Same same difference, really. Also, I think so, it's a. I think the two movies, in a way, really kind of encapsulate the difference between Miyazaki and Takahata and how they construct their narratives. Yeah. Where Takahata, in all of his films that we've covered so far, are all set in very real places, and like we said, with the background, it really helps with that because they like built like they very well constructed it and like built it off real places. Because in Fireflies, it's uh, during the war, and then in uh, Only Yesterday, it was in this rural rural community, and it's like it's all about exploring these real Japanese places and like the kind of character of them and what they mean to the people there while Miyazaki almost likes to always take a fan fantasyful location and have it be a place for the characters to develop in themselves so even places set in kind of like real times like Totoro or Kiki it's still not an exact place or an exact time 
it's a fantasy kind of location. And even like we said with Porco Rosso, it's this um, play playscape that these people are kind of trapped in, this kind of a, a place between history. Yeah. Even if Miyazaki picks a real location uh, and a very real place in history, like in Porco Rosso, he will play with it and romanticize it and like fictionalize the place and maybe the reality intrudes at places but mainly he's writing alternate histories and alternate worlds uh like in all of his other films i think i think yeah even like if we're supposed to assume we're in reality like in kiki and totoro we are always in a non-place in a weird to pin down time with lot with anachronisms while takahara always focuses very specifically on real issues and in Pompoko, real folklore and real history and real places, and also like um, on people interacting with like the history and um, the changes to Japanese society in Grave of the Fireflies and Only Yesterday. Yeah, I think that's actually uh, going back to what I said also about the format. I really like how it's presented as like a modern documentary because it's almost like the modern way the histories are retold, in which no individual character is like the main character or the most important. And you can even say a lot of them don't properly like develop in a traditional sense, but it's about this large narrative of history being like retold and recounted to the current generations. Almost like Takahata is like talking to the children of today, explaining to them how like Japan has become the way it is. Yeah, I also think like um, go, going back to like the, the the beginning, I think it's really interesting how uh, we we start out showing the tanuki as like uh, actual animals, and then they transform into these uh, like go goofy uh, cartoons uh, that uh, any Japanese viewer would know from like uh, you know folklore, fairy tales, that kind of thing. Um, because like um, on the one hand, um, it it establishes this uh, liminal space, as you uh, described it, uh, Nyad, b b between um, like the, the real actual uh ecology of uh, endangered animals uh and their habitats changing because of human development and this uh fantastical uh place of like uh sorcery and shape-shifting um at, at the same time it, it also kind of um makes the uh the film explicitly uh like a, a fairy tale like you you could imagine that uh that this is like a telling of the actual species, uh, the, the, the act, actual tanuki living there um, and the consequences of the urban development and just just stylized. And, and that's what's happening uh, when they transform while running down that hill. What, what's happening isn't that they're literally transforming, but that we are entering like the, the film's version of like how to tell that story. Yeah, I think it's, that's true. And also the way that it's presented, it, it really like builds like these many layers of narrative that Takahata is trying to get across with the history. Where it's like we have the real um, tanukis, like the realistic looking ones, representing literal real tanukis that are being displaced by Japanese urbanization. But then we get the uh, anthropomorphized ones that represent the myth and the uh, the kind of like magical and folk stories that like Japan might be losing in its urbanization. And then we get the, the when they transform into people and they become the Japanese like rural people that are being displaced by the urbanization. Because even at the end of the movie, we see a couple of people in Tama Hills who like used to live there and they're seeing like the memories of how it used to be. So Takahata is like really talking about like three entirely different things like all at once. And it's all like very melded together in a way that it's like constantly shifting between on right before our eyes. I can even one up you on that because... Interestingly enough, um, when we're just talking about tanuki presentation, of course they can transform into humans and objects, but there's actually three distinct modes of tanuki transformation. We have, for one, like the realistic tanuki to, with which we're introduced to the film, like we're almost getting a sense of it being a documentary because we see very re realistically drawn tanuki just eating persimmons, or I, I think it is. Then they transform into the anthropomorph uh, anthropomorphized version, as you describe it, which is like kind of the version of Tanuki where we give them human traits and culture, where they actually, instead of just being physically anthropomorphized, like they gain a sort of human uh, aspect to them because they can reflect cultural issues and discrepancies between the city and the nature. And not just as animals, but as actual like subjects in the sense of speaking and culture producing subjects. And then we have a third mode, and this is the one you, I think, uh, skipped, 
which is when they turn to these goofy caricature tanuki. And that happens whenever like they're celebrating or like hedonistically indulging in, in food or dance or drink or whatever, when they turn into this like very goofy cartoonish version, which is by the way, a reference to like a famous manga by uh, Shigeru Sugiura. Um, whom Takahara was quite a fan of. Like there was always like uh, these goofy cartoonish Tanuki characters. And I think the important aspect of this uh, third mode, if we want to call it, is that this is when they kind of become the myth. Where they become like the stupid kind of uh, <laughs> dancing, hedonistic, pleasure-seeking uh, uh, um, characters from folklore. I would namely personally argue that um, the anthropomorphized version is not fully the version we experience in uh, in, in, in old folklore because the, it, it humanizes them quite a bit. They have much more complex and pressing issues than the Tanuki in folklore stories seem to uh, usually find themselves in, whereas the uh, goofy cartoonish tricksters do exhibit exactly kind of, if we want to put it like this, the stereotypical Tanuki experience. And uh, like... Um, what, what, what one of the texts uh, uh, we read up on, on like uh, talking specifically about um, the, these tanuki as uh, yokai uh, p- poses them as like sort of um, a, an animal that's at the border of um, of nature and culture like, like be, be, because uh, tanuki uh, like raccoons uh, in the west uh, are like scavengers and they uh they, they they can like eat uh human garbage or uh, human cultivated berries and stuff like that while also surviving in the forest so so in that way it's sort of like a natural fit for them to like uh be these travelers between spirits and uh, and humans and shapeshifters um i th- i think it's interesting what you uh, point out hipster like how they're um them like being in these different places at once uh, also like kind of fits with the movie uh doing a lot different things at once uh being uh, a family picture f- f- full with uh like goofy comedic fun uh and party scenes and like it's deeper political uh implications and, and issues that it wants to tackle yeah a family picture with big balls that are used to punch down the police in an act of eco-terrorism oh that's, yeah, yeah. F- fuck the i think police. that's a hard sell i think that's a hard I really, sell i really like that aspect because in, in, in that way <laughs> i think it's it's maybe takahara consciously just trying to be as accurate to the myths and the cultural history as possible because even in the uh, the earlier scenes where uh, gonta lays the attacks on the construction site they literally say that they kill five people just like in the old myths where Tanuki would like trick you into like drowning or something like the olden style form of mischievousness where you yeah. could end up dead, but it's still like all fun and games. But and also this scene is actually a great uh, moment to point out exactly what I meant earlier with the like third goofy mode, because as you can see, like the elder is like t- telling them, hey, listen, we can't celebrate now. We got to like mourn the death of those people. Please be quiet for a minute. And the Tanuki literally fall apart and start laughing and turn into goofy mode because this is like the, the trickster nature that, that resurfaces. Like as you point out that this is like kind of their actual traditional folkloristic mode where they're like very self-centered and only fun and pleasure seeking. Yeah. Whereas like the ones that stay anthropomorphized are exactly those which aren't already joining into the celebration and are still like talking about okay let's mourn about this death we actually have committed something here like the more self-reflective sort of tanuki i think that also ties into the uh the kind of nature of referring to them as like uh, people who are displaced by urbanization like rural living people in japan where um we see the tanuki as they're kind of serious about wanting to protect their land but they're just a bit too distracted by like partying and like basically just living their own lives we even see this thing where like they're told that they shouldn't uh they shouldn't breed for the next couple of years so that they can concentrate on their mission and keep their numbers low but then they just do it anyway because basically people just live their lives they can't like constantly be concerned by this like one united effort and i think that's kind of a commentary on how a lot of the people in these rural places kind of just like ended up living in the city because that's just what happened and they were too busy with themselves to already like do any major effort to protect the world around them 
but uh, at the same I think, time, I, we, I, I think yeah. it's much. The film is much more an indictment of uh, like the the unstoppable march of urbanization than it is. An yeah, that, that of, is true. Uh, but I do think there is a little criticism there of like the Tanuki constantly being distracted and being like not alert to the situation at all times. They only try kind of like pranks and stuff, as opposed to like a genuine concerted effort. Yeah, I can definitely see that. But at the same time, the the whole discussion of like what to do about it is uh, is like a, a central point of conflict within the film like like the uh one of the main thing that like causes disagreement within the T- tanuki uh, village uh, which is what what exactly do we do uh to these hu- these humans is it okay to like go into direct conflict and kill them or should we yeah. uh, try peaceful means uh yeah, I, yeah yeah i don't think it's impugning the tanuki methods in this way for like their character or like for their easygoingness because after all that is what makes a tanuki but the film shows that their method of trying to posit a resistance is to utilize media the first thing they kind of do is steal a tv and see what every act of theirs does to the media how the media reacts to it and decide on a next course of action for that and this seems to be where their attempt at a peaceful solution, it, uh, or rather peaceful, like the, uh, I would say, like this is there's these acts of ecoterrorism. So of course, like dead people are unfortunate, but in this sense, a sort of collateral damage to them. Whereas, like they were trying a more peaceful solution, and not like the the war effort that uh, was pushed by some other Tanuki, the constantly during the film was not like the actual course of action that the elders wanted to take. This is less uh, uh, an, an, an impugnment of uh, being. I guess too lazy or too self-absorbed to do an actual resistance, but more or less a categorical rejection of the explicitly violent and warlike means of doing this resistance. But unfortunately for the Tanuki, by trying to resist using the tools of the oppressor, if you so will, I'm using big language here, but um, by using the media in order to resist the uh, very source of media, the city, they kind of feed into their game, which is also, again, reflected in... Their final act is like demonstrating Tanuki identity and the ultimate haunting by giving the parade in the city and the people just go like uh, uh, not believing it just the next day. And as soon as like a media, uh, uh, a rather capitalist guy co- goes and says, oh yeah, we did this as a PR gag. Everyone's like, oh yeah, makes sense. Of course this would have to be media. Because the understanding for the world, and nature and the magical and spiritual is completely different mediated through media and it would be unbelievable to believe in any such thing without the media the tanuki have kind of chosen means by which they can never really represent themselves where what goes on in front of the camera and is framed through media will never like really achieve what they see as their ends what what they will conceive of a desirable state because the only solution this kind of eco-terrorism provided them ultimately is integrate into the system and sell your uh, uh, or your culture, your spiritualism, your magic as a commodity, or you stop existing entirely. Yeah, yeah you uh, might be right there, because there also is another little aspect of it in which it's like the kind of like capitalist and industrialist machine that like Japan has become is just going to like run over everything else without competition. Because again, the way it kind of presents it is the Tanuki are these like mischievous but like just fun and like life-loving people that you kind of just want to mess around and get drunk and party and trick people and because that that is like their deep nature they can't resist against the machine that just just wants to like mow over them and sell the land and that's why we see towards the end that they kind of just become the humans they can only integrate that's the only form of survival because otherwise like there's no other method they can go up against like like the characters even say you can scare off the humans, but there's unlimited numbers of humans. Like, there will always be more people ready for a paycheck. There won't be as yeah. many people that can so easily be frightened off. I also think it's kind of wonderful how the entirety of the film's conflict is, like, embodied within, like, the first five to ten minutes where we see the uh, basically terraforming of Tama Hills, where you have the picture of, like, the Tanuki living in, like, abandoned human settlements, like, having a very uh, peaceful rural life, like, just living on the fruits of the land and then suddenly an excavator comes in and sl- smashes through the roof of this thing then you have all these themes where like the entirety of tamil's uh surface is is terraformed and you have this wonderful little cute image where little excavators are co- uh, digging away a leaf yeah uh, yeah like caterpillars yeah it's a real yeah. nice visual 
Yeah, it has a like like short series of uh, of little visual metaphors for the uh, development going on. Uh, that's also where we have like uh, like Hipster mentioned earlier the the the, the Buddha and uh, and his monks just like uh, digging it like 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 it was uh, like, um, like a little garden for them, uh, or or the um, uh, the the excavator just like uh, d- digging uh, what like looks to be like on, on scale like, like a, a, sm- a small uh pile of dirt but what it's actually digging into is like the entire mountainside just carved out yeah that's great um, even it, uh, it, even more of a little uh, gag like the one where it shows the uh the little video game on the screen for a second where it's like these things just like plow right over because it's, it's almost just is a game like urban development is just like a bunch of people like so far away in a boardroom deciding that this area will make the money now and like that's it like that's the decision and I, th- I think it's really interesting that it's like really early in the movie they're showing it so so again they're establishing like um uh, the, the expectations for the movie which is like it, it's really free in its uh animation like like it's um uh, especially with the transforming tanuki which is just uh, must have been an absolute blast to animate uh those like transformations and magic tricks and stuff like that uh we, we need to like Set, set our imaginations free a little bit to uh, get into their world. And uh, one of the real interesting things about this opening scene that I, quite, I haven't quite mentioned yet that I'm going to get into a bit, a little bit later is um, how the scene also has an interesting element that we tend to neglect, namely that the Tanuki lived on a, an abandoned farm that was abandoned by humans. So we already established that the Tanuki are not like the self-sustaining, completely natural force living in the like completely natural forest, but they already exist in this, how should I call it, like a balanced relationship with humans, where they like remain where the humans have left, where they already depend on what the humans have built in the past. Which reminds me oddly of the scene in Only Yesterday, when they look at the nature and landscape and the question comes up like, do you think this is all natural? No, it's not. We built this. Humans built this. Humans and nature together. So a recurring Takahara theme. Yeah, and I think that also ties in pretty well into like the uh, the folklore aspect, where the Tanuki aren't just uh, being animals in an environment, but they are a they are a cultural figure that like is being like slowly shifted into Japanese culture as it is like changing now. Um, so I think that's really what like Takahata was getting at. Where and again, this this whole film feels like kind of a lament for a lot of things, like a requiem for this kind of rural setting. The, uh, the tanukis as like animals in this environment and also this kind of cultural heritage that is like inevitably being shifted and commodified in modern culture yeah yeah de- definitely uh, um there's uh, th- there's this way ha- where um as mentioned earlier that uh, tanuki like took up this cultural place because it had this um like space uh, within the ecosystem b- between uh, the like human development and nature but when when this human urbanization becomes so extreme that uh, this balance can't be uh, maintained, then uh, the 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 cultural image remains, but it loses uh, its uh, significance and uh, and meaning and becomes uh, commodified. Like like we have um, this uh, w- w- what did he call it? Uh, Wonderland. Wonderland. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ex- exactly. Just just this vague idea of a like amusement park. Um, and and like he takes credit for for this uh, magical procession, which uh, like is, is like a really clear um, like allegory for for the way in which uh, th- these cultural images lose uh, their, their significance and just become uh, like sort of arbitrary. Yeah, they become interchangeable like commodities to be exported, to be shown to tourists and like curious people alike as the realm and the space where, and we've also seen this like in the, there was a scene like talking about uh, replacing like shrine statues, like the little Buddha statues. And the idea was like, yeah, you kind of have to do a ritual and a blessing and whatnot before it happens, before you can replace them. But ultimately like the pragmatism of just get rid of them wins out for the humans, like the entirety of this respect and this fusion and synergy with nature that the Tanuki kind of stand for, as well as the Shinto religion in general, uh, has as a huge part of it, is fading in favor of expansion, of commodification, of selling stuff in a in a in a in a, in a, in a theme park, and production. I mean, we shouldn't forget that the end of the film shows us very clearly that the Tanuki they needed to either 
the part on the ship which I need to remark is exactly where they have the third goofy mode. Like on the ship, they are all in this very goofy form, like reminiscing and harkening back to the purest form of the Tanuki, the ones who couldn't adapt, the ones who had to leave and like really depart from this world. Or they became salarymen, where they have the big bags under their eyes, like as an allegory, like like a, like a worn-out salaryman, like has bags under his eyes because of lack of sleep, obviously, but it's Tanuki who are deprived of energy. We're like now the main consumers of energy drinks because they need to pick me up. And it's a really sad state of affairs to show like what how exhausting and uh, draining this kind of lifestyle for Tanuki is, but how they are kind of forced into doing this to be able to subsist and exist in the in in. A human society that hasn't gotten a place for them anymore where their magic and their elders and their spirituality and their community could function uh, yeah i think actually... that ties in very well um again back to the whole like cultural thing and the whole displaced of rural people where we get the whole salary man with bags under their eyes tied out from like the uh the rat race the daily grind and it's kind of uh i think takahata getting at maybe like the something about like the japanese spirit where there's been something lost in this urbanization where people are not like enjoying life as much as they should be. They're worn out. They're disconnected from kind of like, like a fun cultural route that they can like have a shared mythology and uh, identity with. And then of course we get a great parallel with the, uh, the foxes because like in all the stories, the Tanuki are like the fun mischievous ones, but the foxes are the, are the cunning, like really trickster ones. They're like, uh, kind of the bastards of the story as, as it goes. And we see the foxes are well adapted to the human world. They're like capitalists all the way. They're willing to like, there's a, there's kind of like an implied almost Yakuza energy to the fox guy. He's got like a room of like uh, hot fox ladies that are like um, mm. maybe prostitutes or something almost. And they're like, they're well embedded into like the seediness and undecidedness of humanity. And they fit well in into this new urban environment. And they try to convince the Tanuki of doing the same. And, and first at first the Tanuki are like, we can't we're tanuki we can't just assimilate you like you foxes they have a much deeper conviction seemingly to that kind of lifestyle that they used to have mm -hmm. yeah but, um, this is where we like kind of like we kind of get the realization that humans are unwilling to like conform to animals as animals also are for are forced to then conform and like live in human society yeah, the interesting thing is, like, we do see this. this is a good point that we do see, like, in in cities, how cities have changed ecosystems, how certain animals have seemingly uh, perfectly adapted to the city life, namely rats or something, who like rummage around in sewers and trash and everywhere in the city, and uh, have found a way to live. But like, evolution takes thousands of years for like phenotypical like changes to really manifest can we imagine mm -hmm. like how adaptable and flexible these these creatures are and for what kind of natural environments they're actually basically primed to exist in it's it's kind of stunning to me that also the tanuki which are also like a, a common guest i would say in the cityscape of japan like eating trash <laughs> um th how they these animals can adapt and how we're like pointed out to us by Takahata that we kind of refuse the sort of synergy with the animals in favor of our complete urbanization and how their only way was to adapt. And I like how he compares that to how the Japanese had to move on from their culture and adapt in the very same way. N kind of eating the trash if you count the salary man life as eating trash. Yeah. I, I mean, it is eating out. trash, right? Energy drinks. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, so just to say, I, I, I think... Um... That there's obviously a lot of criticism of uh, the modern capitalist reality of Japan, but I think the greatest uh, like indictment of capitalism uh, in in this film is like for uh, for a filmmaker and animator like Isao Takahata to declare that in in a capitalist world people wouldn't believe magic in front of their eyes uh, unless yeah. it was for commercial reasons. Exactly. Like I, I, that, 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 that whole TV. carnival and the reaction to it is just the most depressing thing, uh, one of the most depressing depressing things in, in the um, in the entire film. Like how, how disconnected from wonder do you have to be for for like that to be the reality? Yeah, I, I really think that that one scene right at the end of the parade where it's like a two mothers talking and their kids were like impressed by the parade, but then they immediately just run back inside to like watch TV or whatever. 
then the mothers are just like chatting about something whatever and they're like that really is the spirit of the whole uh hopelessness of the situation that tanuki's face because it's no matter what you do the capitalist machine keeps on spinning and like the uh everyone has to go on with their daily lives almost almost in a parallel to the way that the like i was saying the tanukis kind of just live their lives and get drunk and party and whatever and they don't notice the world around them disappearing it's like people on the other side as well in the urban environments just keep on spinning their lives and they don't care about the environment being destroyed because it's not like it's not what's important to them i think uh I think an important question to ask about the movie um, is like the question of is it actually futile according to to the film? Is the the fight against urbanization the the, the uh, fight for for the environment? Is it is it just a fut- uh, is it pure futility or is it uh, just impossible for for these specific characters to do it because they are like too uh, too kind and like not ready for the type of conflict they're, they're up against. Well, what it, what it's getting at by showing us both sides, like living their lives and just things happening, it's, it's really just the systematic problem. Like the, the way the system is, is that one will just take over the other. Because it's almost like, you know, game theory, where like one side wants to win and knows the rules, but then the other side like doesn't care about winning. So it's like one will always conquer. One is always willing to do whatever it takes. So you can't... Uh, you can't ever win against someone who knows what game they're playing, and so the machine, the, like the industrial machine, will keep on like steamrolling over nature, and nature doesn't have any form of pushback. So I would argue that we do see an interesting kind of success after all in the Tanuki, namely that, um, of course, it shows us with like a morning, and it says like the ecoterrorism didn't really succeed. But rather than saying that the kind of culture and the traditional Japanese subject disappeared, it has uh, been that it has been uh, absorbed into society. These tanuki can go home and transform into their anthropomorphized forms. They can celebrate in like a forest clearing out there when they meet and are happy about seeing each other. While they're bearing with the oppressive circumstances of... uh, uh, capitalism of being a salary man of this very draining wage labor, uh, wage labor um, they do retain an element of their I want to say like authentic tanuki uh, Japanese identity which they can return to they retain it with a sense of resilience I would argue yeah I definitely think that's true uh, because yeah not only is the ending like framed in such like a positive way like that but also, uh, in almost like a, more of a meta way, this movie was incredibly popular, and like we said, won Best Picture in Japan by its own like academies and stuff. And everyone loves the movie, and it's so like insanely rich and detailed with folklore and historic uh, references. That it's like that that is still clearly alive in Japan, but yeah, it's just like more subdued now, and it's like that has to be remembered a bit less than it used to be. So again, what I say, this whole film feels like a, a lament. Or like Takahata yeah, uh, just wants it, to it, like it's not just much, to remind people a little bit. I think it's not as much that the like uh, element for that the symbols and cultural icons are disappeared because like the the they obviously like still a part of Japanese uh, culture like that's the reason it has all these references and people catch them. But like I, I think it laments how they lost their significance and and like it's a reminder that yeah um like. To, uh, I, I'm sure after this movie came out, Tanuki like became much more like uh, popular as like uh, than than they were before. I can I, I can oh, at least no imagine. Doubt. Also, oh, no how doubt. fitting is it that like the uh, this movie is a is an anime, which is basically kind of a new art form like to Japan historically, only starting around about you know the 50s and 60s properly, and it's like a retelling of all these myths in like one neat package. Like Dakahara is like passing this on to a new generation as well and showing it in like an incredible fantastical way that you could like never depict before because like the animation is like so incredibly fluid and like all the wacky transformations are just like truly brought to life in yeah, a way that you could have never imagined that's, that's a great point that. that's <laughs> a great point that's also made in the text carnivalist ecoterrorism in pompoko by todd andrew bollick and he concludes this text basically by summarizing that the dogged survival of the Tanuki reflects that of Studio Ghibli with its conspicuously Japanese aesthetic, with the insistence of those two auteurs basically at the front of the Studio Ghibli 
Keep, re, keeping it to a very specifically Japanese uh, background and then that zeitgeist. Uh, Takahara more so than Miyazaki, obviously we talked about this, but this is also a thought that occurred to me that Pompoko is kind of like an anti-Totoro, not in that it has a different thesis, but that it like highlights it from a different angle. Where in Totoro we imagine like Miyazaki is yearning for like this alternate history through like this time and space free zone where we can find sub uh, like kamis in the in the nature again and like the children and the community are in existence and we have like this sort of spiritual dimension to all of this. Here uh, Takahata shows like the the other side of the coin like we are we are seeing it from like the outside spiritual world that fails to incorporate itself fully into the capitalist world and can only remain on the inside as the people of this world of the people like who transform and shift between identities and modes in their existence of life um can retain a traditional element that has the spiritual aspect while they also need to function in a world that is not made for that it is very much moving the spirituality and the outside world found in totoro into the inside of those people in the system retaining it with like the sense of resilience that i mentioned earlier um, I also think uh, what what hipsters are getting at there's actually like interesting the idea of the connection between uh, like old spirituality and uh, and animation is actually a, 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 a kind of like a acknowledged uh, part of like uh, animation uh, theory. Uh, I think uh, Sergei Eisenstein specifically. Uh, lauded uh, Disney uh, and uh, and his animation works as like a sort of continuation of like um, old animism. This this idea of making non living things alive. Yeah. That, that was just um, yeah. Like, like it, it, he he had like really grand things to say about it. And I think that's I, what the I, word I, means, I almost, right? Animation, animus. Uh, yeah, soul. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and that that obviously connects into uh, into Shinto and like animism as a like religious practice uh so so there is an argument to be made that like a- animation is like the natural um evolution the the, na- the perfect medium to tell this kind of story in yeah also fitting how like disney movies a lot of the early ones were like snow white and cinderella like these are all like these are very old like folk tales from central europe and stuff that are now like being retold in like a, a it- fantastical way I had this epiphany just as you said this, Platon, where I suddenly realized that the Tanuki putting on the parade is kind of like Studio Ghibli making the very Japanese films for a worldwide audience who are then turning it into the Disney of Japan and it's like really marketed and like popular and in the cinemas and merchandise and every Totoro. And it's kind of the same, right? Like they're not outright condemning it. Studio Ghibli is like not averse to this. This is kind of their way of surviving. They have to kind of find a space where this sort of animation which is what is the parade is animation. Not only is it a celebration of all the animation talent that went into this film, but also it is literal animation as in the Tanuki conjure up like spirits and souls, like just to animate like illusions and so on. So this is a very wonderful like overlap and and, and I guess a statement of the artist expressing these kinds of positions of culture to a world. Yeah, I think you're dead on with that because the parade literally is Ghibli in the way that we see uh, Porco Rosso, uh, Kiki and Totoro flying through the parade. If you look c- closely. Yeah, they're, oh, they're, are they? They're, they're, yeah, yeah, they're, they're, they're there in the background. Makes a you can like free, freeze frame and see them. Damn, I didn't even notice that. I mean, well... <laughs> But with the parade, it's really just like this visual splendor, this carnival, this this like inflow of information. Like you can look at everything and everywhere. And I think that's very easy. That's why it's very easy to miss something going on in there. Yeah, yeah. there's so a bunch of references. I can't remember the specific name of it, but I think this parade has a, like a, a name because uh, when I went to a manga exhibition in the British Museum, they had this massive, huge uh like curtain that they would pull across this old uh, kabuki theater and it's like a traditional huge painting of this like yokai parade so all mm. these figures and all these things are like very connected oh yeah like they're, they're definitely that this um all, all all these uh really old uh like f- fantastical uh, spirit paintings that like people like see as uh, the precursor to manga which is all obviously like the precursor to anime yeah, and I guess uh, because this is like a really fitting moment, I, I kind of think it's interesting to reflect like how um, Pompoko itself comments 
not only on its legacy as like reanimating folklore, but also like rewriting and re-perspectivizing folklore. Because what it is doing is it's taking like a very established kind of story format, which is usually that like a human lord or whatever is faced with like a tanuki or a fox doing tricks and haunting them, like the, the causing some ruckus. And then the lord will be like, fox, what have you done? And the fox is like, oh, I needed to do this for this and that reason. And then he's like, all right, I will either purge all of you or you will promise to never transform in the city. And like all these kinds of stories where uh, the, the, there were clear transgressors, which were the foxes and the tanukis doing something, either being like manipulative and like scheming or like goofing around, committing jokes and cruelty on people just for the fun of it. And like then a decision kind of a decision that um, uh, as Melek or Tabazi in his text Reanimating Folklore argues is reflective of a sort of cultural anxiety of the time to try to explain what are these people which are causing like harm and mischief no doubt like in a sense of maybe mental illness uh, uh, like aggressions and so on and um, what are these people who are always only out for their own gain and manipulating left and right like they kind of try to explain differences in human identities through these spiritual beings and these fictional beings that exist so the thing that pompoko does is it takes the legacy of this kind of story and instead of uh, instead of like continuing the trend of treating the uh, the tanuki as another it posits it as like the human subject the tanuki is who we are supposed to identify with and through whose struggle we are supposed to examine the setting and this is very interesting because we at the same time as we like acknowledge that the element of internalizing this culture and spirituality is a core theme of Pompoko. We also, as the viewer, are doing that literally in the moment where we consider the Tanuki our stand-in in the story, as we uh, see in them a conflict that we are facing. We, as an assumed Japanese audience, I need to be clear, like it is not my personal conflict because I'm not born in Japan and raised in Japan at the time, but like this is a cultural issue and anxiety of accommodating and uh, uh, fitting into a society that is radically changing and is abandoning all these previous sort of modes of existence. And the Tanuki is the one that reminds us where we come from in this place. We identify the Tanuki in the same way. They were othered in the original stories back in the folklore. They were always the outsider, the weird thing that was broken. Now we are the weird thing as a traditional Japanese identity and we are on the outside and we need to reflect how can we integrate, what can we internalize. The tanuki is, is not just an external element to ourselves, but internal to ourselves, if, if, if what I'm saying makes any sense to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah de I get definitely. It. Like the, the whole positing um, a, a different perspective on, a, on like uh, humanity, like uh, challenging uh, the anthropocentric uh, view, which is so prevalent in cultures throughout the world. Uh, like uh, even in, uh, in in Japan, especially uh, like after its uh, Westernization, um, like uh, Shinto and other anime, uh, animist uh, religions and practices um, are in a way like uh, like pretty radical because they posit that uh, humans are as much like a, a agents within the world as any given uh, tree or animal. Uh, or uh, like natural scenery is. Yeah, the movie even kind of shows this when uh, the one of the fox, not a fox master, um, one of the one of the Tanuki masters dies after the big parade. We see literally Buddha himself like sweep down from the clouds to lift his soul up, in like a way that it's like each one of these Tanuki is like a def is like an individual soul that is completely like valued by a god, as much as any human would be. Yeah, and, and yeah, I guess also the, like the ship scene, right? That's a very explicit reference to, uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, like the Tale of Genji, the bamboo cutter. Oh, I think it might be that. Or yeah, there was, there's another the ending, like, famous old tale that has similar allusions. It I might, might just be thinking be general, of the, the like, very Buddhist thing. The fan the... story from the Tale of Yashima. I think they said like the Battle of Yashima with the with the samurai shooting the fan. Yeah. But that is kind of where, like, the, those Tanuki who couldn't integrate, I talked about this a bit earlier, those Tanuki who couldn't integrate ended up on the ship, like, sailing away from this world. Kind of, this is a very, I don't know, we, we're going to talk about this motif more, which Takahara will use in, in when we uh, get to the tale of Princess Kaguya, because uh, yeah, it is it, also in it there. 
it returned in a big way in a, in a in a similarly like really kind of sad but also beautiful way like in a, at the same time these tanuki are celebrating their uh i guess identity which they're not abandoning they're not leaving the being tanuki behind but they couldn't transform they couldn't adapt and at the same time like we're, we are clear here this represents a sort of death this represents fading away and it doesn't just represent death then they literally say that they all drowned like they, yeah, I they guess. actually all die. <laughs> mm-hmm. I guess. I mean, this is such an interesting way. You said earlier that this entire film is kind of framed like a documentary. So the objective narrator can sa- stand there and say, yeah, they all drowned later while we are witnessing a scene of like sublime Buddhist like spirituality and transcendence. This uh, crude like mixture of uh, speaking to the fact and presenting the whole, um, I guess, uh, spiritual dimension of it is like in such stark contrast. It is kind of like in that moment making us aware of exactly what is happening to the Japanese culture and also what to some extent the film is doing. Like it's pointing out this, how this spirituality is kind of seizing and imp- becoming impossible through exactly the kind of narration it gives itself. Yeah, I, I think the film does like a really good job of this juxtaposition of like uh, elements throughout it, or maybe not elements, but just kind of like emotions in the way that like, yeah, like it's it's kind of a very depressing uh, looked back, looking back at it because it's all about like these animals and their hopeless fight against losing their home and territory. But again, it's, it's played in such a, just incredibly goofy, fun way. Like, for example, there's the scene where it's a uh, Gonta. He, like, stages a coup d'etat against them. And it's, like, supposed to be a dramatic scene where, like, he's, he's, he's taking over. But then immediately they just get distracted into, like, a stupid conversation about how to cook mice the best and what would taste the best. <laughs> it's, like, really tying into that kind of folklore thing of, like, very serious topics. Because a lot of folklore is kind of... Uh, in indebted into those like moral lessons but then also just like the fun of it like there is this fundamental play through all of it a bit like Porco Rosso how all the characters exist in this world of play that like reality is just coming crashing down on towards the end I, I, I think also um, that's part of the uh, commodification theme uh, we talked about uh, the, the discussion of food uh, like get, gets to like human methods of cooking and they, they like uh, at one point uh, i think specifically uh talk about like oh but but we really like human food we would lose that if we killed them um yeah which well, i yeah, think that, is that like, goes back to the synergy of nature thing where, like yeah, Takahata, but, but also like with only of... yesterday believes that there is like a perfect in between between humanity and nature and that well, the, but... the tanukis could want that but humans are, of course totally unwilling yeah, but but at the same time, um, it, it's also like a recognition of like what exactly why capitalism feels so unstoppable because people like stuff, people like consuming this stuff. Even th- this really traditional village l- loves them some fried uh, foods like burgers. Yeah, it's fucking junk food. We gotta stress yeah, this. It's junk food. junk food. They want junk food, so it, it's the most like poignant point to be made here right every kind of everyone can agree all we all want junk food despite it being like a net negative on the world and that's just a really interesting conflict that puts us again into the shoes of the tanuki like immediately yeah you, they, they they fall in love with tv they're watching wrestling on it they're playing video games they're like they love all the modern stuff so like in and, a way and again it's a representation yeah. of the people who who can't resist the urbanization despite the fact that like it might not be in their best interest and there's no condemnation of that too right there's no like the mindset of like something we've lost is embodied through us our, our hedonistic consumption but instead like the tanuki are deliberately chosen as sort of hedonistic subjects we're like not yeah. going yeah, into it's kind of showing an, an honestness to it where it's like yeah can you really blame people for just wanting to live a comfortable easy going life that has a bunch of entertainment like it's it's not trying i don't think it's yeah it's trying to be too moralistic there it's just showing again like i was saying the the matter of fact, like the, the capitalist machinery will always find a way to coerce people, like rather through just like outright buying them or just having p- things that they want that they couldn't get otherwise. Yeah, it, um, it, 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 it kind of like, yeah, it, it, it's what makes it m- more sad and makes them a lot uh, also really sympathetic is they, they don't want like anything like they, they don't want to like crush the city and all it stands for. All they really want is to have a place to like keep living their life and uh, and like keep their their culture and uh, and and the environment they've grown up with and like learned to to live with. 
I think an important that's all. That's all part. Yeah, yeah, and I think an important part of why they are so failing, like in a metaphorical sense, is because their cultural practices are sort of ridiculed by the public, not explicitly in the film, but like the entire framing of what the Tanuki do is by the media treated as superstition and people imagining things and people blowing shit out of proportion to like whatever or commit or committing crimes. Like the entire idea of this culture being real is treated by the media as nothing but like old folk and like uh, uh, gullible uh, uh, rural people like falling for some uh, delusions and natural, you know, uh, uh, um, um, accidents that happen and like interpreting them in stupid ways. All this stuff goes to superstition. This is also important like just taking away the little Buddhist statues and uh, um, being done with it afterwards like un uh, instead of doing the proper procedures or whatever because it is superstition. And the idea, and, and this is interesting, okay, the Tanuki's primary method of resistance is haunting. Like, they're very traditional thing. Haunting has, like, this in interesting characteristic because, like, something that is haunted is kind of, um, through a spiritual kind of way connected to the past. Like, it's either, like, a ghost or, like, a being that has always been there. Like, it's, like, assigned yeah. with a coded nature, like, enacting it's some sort of revenge. In which or places have a sort of memory within our culture. Uh, exactly. Haunting, yeah. Yeah. And... This has a wonderful scene by the end of the film. I'm actually going to quote uh, Michael Dylan Foster uh, in the text Haunting Modernity here, that there's a, a scene in the end of the film uh, which shows, like, uh, the Tanuki restoring and recapturing the um, um, old place that was there before Tama Hills turned into a suburban space. And uh, Michael Dylan Foster says, in this extended scene, they cause a landscape from the past to reassert itself into the present. Buildings drop away to reveal pristine forests and tranquil rice paddies with children and tanuki alike playing in this pastoral world. For the tanuki as well as for the human residents of the new suburb, it is an, in it is an intensely nostalgic moment, an overlaying of the present with the memories of the past. It is a haunting scene. Oh yeah, that that, that scene is just so, like, really powerful. Like, it uh, got, like, uh, tears welling up watching that it, it surprised me like uh there the, at the end because like uh like the film doesn't have that much like direct drama with like characters uh, in conflict with each other and like relationships changing over time that kind of thing um but but what it does have is exactly that that intense nostalgia that feeling of a place uh, disappearing yeah, I think the most powerful bit of that is the one lady who sees what I think is kind of implied maybe her dead mother, like, gardening the old, like, little uh, house, and she just, like, runs out to her, like, overwhelmed by this kind of thing that has been lost, not in just a, a personal sense, but then again, of course, reflecting in a greater cultural sense. Yeah, yeah, like, it's, it's, it's a loss of community in that way, and it, it, it becomes, like, more direct in that way. I, th I think it's, it's one of the first times where in the movie where we actually like truly like empathize with uh, the the human characters and actually see what that they are also losing something um as, aside from like awesome carnivals uh mm. in, uh, in 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 the process of this urbanization um and just to again recontextualize it with like the primary method of tanuki resistance being haunting like staging like some spooky magical ghost like events uh, and supernatural forces to show the media. It's interesting how haunting at the same time is like an insistence of the past into the present, uh, present in like this literal way of like the Tanuki trying to gain their like their political uh, position again. But also, of course, it's like the perfect metaphor for how culture just doesn't disappear even if you bulldoze everything down and build new cities over it. It disappears only when like people themselves like forget it. And the haunting itself is embodied in superstition is embodied in uh, um believing in acts of transcendence is embodied in engaging with this culture and not treating it simply as like a media spectacle or commodity and i see like this sense of haunting also appears again when the uh, reporters by the end of the film try to like talk to the tanuki and try to capture them on film and like exchange opinions with them and they explicitly state we can't we can't make our audience believe that the Tanuki are real unless we like capture the transformation, unless, unless we like literally um, 
gain this uh, objective factual piece of information, which is like kind of the opposite of a haunting, right? You, you never ca capture the ghost on camera. But there they are trying to do it and implying that the reporters, despite being well-meaning, despite being well-adjusted uh, uh, to this, are using a piece of media, a piece of technology that is incompatible with hauntings, is inc in incompatible with this mode of ex expressing culture. Yeah, and uh, that, that's actually uh, a discussion that happens within environments and organizations. Like, uh, what um, to what degree does, like, the media narrative matter to, to what degree do does like uh, creating uh, a, a like media interest uh, matter and and it it's actually like historically like been like much less useful than like direct action uh, and lobbying yeah also if i'm not mistaken i believe they even like make this like a an actual part of the narrative where they say that one guy captured the parade on camera but when he looked at it uh, it just came up blank so like you, you actually cannot capture magic on camera. Yeah. Almost yeah. in the way that like you cannot like objective like make an objective uh statement about like the I guess like the quality of the culture and the exactly. importance of the spirituality to the Japanese people. It doesn't fit in that, with the like rigid uh, objective capitalist worldview. That's that's a, the exact reason why uh, that capitalist system is incompatible with the way of life of the Tanuki because you can't put a value on like like a, a commodity value on a culture that's being lost uh, but you can put a value on the land that you're selling to people um i think also like what uh Nyad, what would you get into how like um how, how, how people d could doesn't don't take seriously the, the tanuki's uh, efforts they, they see it as like oh just weird stuff uh you know um, I, I think there's uh, a reading of this movie where the Tanuki aren't just stand-ins for uh, like a Japanese cultural memory, but like um, an allegory for indigenous peoples uh, being like displaced uh, within their uh, uh, the, the the places that, that they call home, um, and 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 to uh, to that allegory, it, it also fits the way that um, like a Native American tribe uh, protesting uh, the, the laying of an oil line might like uh, do a do, do a uh, like a ritual scene in protest which yeah. some might see as like weird old superstition uh and and, and like theater but and, and not like this serious expression of the spiritual need that it is um i think it's also why like the that uh haunting uh ending where they like see uh, like recapture the landscape for a brief moment this is so powerful because you you imagine uh, at least i imagine like all these uh peoples across uh like the world who have experienced that like uh in in reality uh and would like yearn for that moment of uh of seeing that again i think it's like really beautiful it's really interesting how this really translates well across the cultural context because in a Japanese context we can't quite see it this way I believe and uh, just to quickly like be responsible with our history here like the Japanese have been themselves like a very colonial kind of power have like subjugated their uh, Ainu diaspora and other uh, uh, ethnic minorities in their country themselves um, but in this sense I think um, in a death of the author way, kind of, we can say, yeah, I, I think I agree. I think I can see the parallel, like, like, especially the uh, uh, Native American and oil line example seems to mirror uh, the kind of urbanization and destruction of the natural habitat of the Tanuki that is going on here in also a very interesting way. Also the commodification yeah. of a culture oh, as yeah. a response. Yeah. And I, I mean, if we're going that way, we can also argue that like kind of the American occupation and the transition to Western capitalism and the urbanization uh, alongside the Western model and like the uh, commodification of uh, um, um, culture is very much similar to a colonizer colonized dynamic where we can see like kind of the Tanuki as a, col a colonial subject being put in a situation where they cannot negotiate their identity anymore with the hegemonic identity of the city uh, that is now going and grabbing their uh, in uh, their living spaces and their cultural spaces and destroying them basically while they need to transform and shift into a mixture of different cultures and traditions and backgrounds yeah. so i, I want to be kind of careful with like the colonizing thing because of the history of world war ii obviously and the american occupation being 
uh, historically speaking, pr kind of well justified considering Japanese war crimes and the horrible uh, facts, of, the horrible facts of Japanese fascism. But we, I mean, we've had Takahata deal with that as well in <laughs> Grave of the Fireflies. So yeah, he's um, definitely aware of that. Exactly. So I think, um, I think, um, quoting Michael Dillon Foster, he said something along the lines of he found the Tanuki transformation, like of um, colonization, more accurate to like the uh, Meiji Restoration, in which Japan really opened itself to be like a, a like a country that had a lot of cultural exports and brought in a bunch of new culture. And one of the first things people were doing was like making a bunch of like um, folklore style products to ship out. So it's like this is something that's already been happening before oh, yeah. World War Two to Japan. Actually, that's a really good point because the Meiji era is basically what led into Japanese fascism down the road. Uh, because uh, in the in the I think it was an explication by uh, Kojin Karantani. I read along the time that we discussed Tokyo, uh, Tokyo, uh, Totoro. <laughs> we didn't discuss Tokyo. We discussed Totoro. Uh, how uh, in Meiji times, uh, Japanese literature shifted to a mode of. Uh, viewing landscape as constructed rather as some natural like uh, mystical spiritual subjective realm which it was in line with their way of using shinto and buddhist stuff to do propaganda for their ends rather than to embrace like the actual spirituality of it so i don't think there's quite the exact parallel because uh, in the meiji restoration really was characterized by using shinto as strongly nationalist propaganda while this film in my view doesn't contain such a commentary on the nationalist dimension and rather focus on capitalism but the similarity where they both align which was what you pointed out is that there's like a objectification of culture going on in both of these uh, historical periods of japan where we in meiji restoration take shinto like to be pragmatically something to use to control the population where in capitalism it is a product to sell to other people yeah um i think um i think even beyond like uh reading uh the, the the film as like uh the, the tanuki as allegory for for people and a culture that that might exist um i i i think you can go even deeper and just like say like no actually they they are just straight up uh tanuki they are non-humans who are like just as valid a subject as any uh other person which gets back to the whole like connection between shinto animism animation and uh anthropomorphization um, this is really interesting uh, uh, text uh, by uh, Gabriel Hadl, um, uh, which, which is uh, pretty broad, but like mostly talking about uh, Japanese media in the context of uh, ecology and uh, like environmental activism. Um, that talks about how um, commodification and like uh, technological representations of nature. Um, actually might have a tendency not to like make us like uh, or want to protect nature more but like uh, care less about it because we have it represented like um, you, you know uh, big like flat screen TVs just showing a jungle like uh, it's instead of actually like doing something about the rainforest and in that way like anthropomorph anthropomorphized um, animals are often just like people who just look cute in some way like, like it's um yeah. it's not actually that uh I, I, what eisenstein hoped what would be like the, the direct yeah. connection between animism and uh and animation um it just occurred to me that we pointed out how the tanuki tried to use media for their message and failed because they used media which is incapable to deliver the message uh, what is this film uh, yeah it's the, media trying to deliver right. the message yeah but mm. um i mean literally the end of the movie the, yeah. Literally, the end of the movie is the main character turning towards the screen and looking right at you and saying, maybe we can talk and maybe us Tanukis can survive, but there's a lot of our animals out there that can't, so maybe think about that. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that's that, that's the closest thing to a direct message. Uh, like, yeah, that's should, like... I should have had the, the South Park soft piano learning your lesson song play during that scene because it's like really <laughs> trying to drive the point home. Yeah, yeah. Kind of realizing that the humans like will do human things and then just like hope that you can at least tell them that we can also live in harmony um but as what, to the, what, I, what i was getting I, at I um yeah, yeah with, with uh the, the was that um uh, G uh gabriel hadel uh points to pompogo as doing something interesting with this uh, anthropomorphism that they, uh, they're not like just humans uh in animal form and they're not just 
animals uh, represented in human forms. Um, uh, she, uh, she writes, uh, they are at once zoomorphic humans and anthropomorphic animals uh, and many other things besides, um, as is their shape-shifting nature, uh, mm. showing the common need of humans and animals for a concrete-free habitat. Such representations yeah. could be characterized as emphatic anthropomorphism, enabling humans to imagine how other beings experience the world as that is um uh a, a non-anthropocentric uh story like, like they're, they're not we're not interested in these uh creatures as stand-ins for humans we're not interested in like um them as uh subjects of uh, like, like objects of human action but like we're interested in them as subjects looking into uh the uh the human beings as uh, as objects which is a, a like pretty radical uh, idea, especially in the face of urbanization. Can I just say I love Fox Guy? I just love how long his face is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like oh yeah, they, they've got like I, I really like the design sensibility of the of uh, the film. Um, now you mentioned earlier how like th this is like t total tangents, uh, like surface level stuff. But like uh, now you mentioned earlier how like the uh, the bags under your eyes that uh, their like little yeah. uh, pattern turns into uh, in, in their human forms um, when they're tired. Um, that, that's pretty good. But, but like, I also like how like each, like every single Tanuki is like different from each other. There, there are no two identical ones. Yeah. Um, which they, all get, they all get a human mode as well that like reflects their features. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I love how like the, those um, like uh, uh, dark patches around their eyes are used in such different ways, like um, almost like war paint like uh, or masks. Uh, but but also mm -hmm. like um, we have the, uh, the 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 elder lady I, I forget her name Otomi or something um, who 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 like has this um, uh, like traditional Japanese outfit, so it sort of looks like like eye shadow in that context of the, her design. That's yeah. one of, uh, that's uh, one of the elders who has these like deep uh l like um uh, bags under yeah. the eyes that the a couple like who who have like a uh, uh, sort of glasses uh shape. yeah they like they like make glasses shapes on the fox i mean on the tanuki but then when they become human they become real glasses yeah, like yeah. a really nice little thing and uh oh uh, i also want to give a quick shout out to the three elders arriving as humans um, that's the most hilarious thing I've ever seen in my fucking life. Yeah, they're just Those these three fucking geezers. demented members of ZZ Top uh, coming in. <laughs> the, this it's train hilarious. <laughs> I want an entire movie about their travels. Yeah, but but, but like the, the the animation in the film isn't like it's not really flashy, but like it's it's always like really solid uh, and, and kind of impressive, especially in the uh, trans transformation sequences and like the. The crowd uh, sequences, like ev yeah, everyone, the, the is transformation like stuff is crazy because they're doing yeah. it like constantly. Like if you even like look in in like the background of every single scene, there's always like one tanuki like transforming a little bit as like a r emotional reaction to something, just constantly like little touches everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's a it, it's a like it, it's a great way to represent th these types of uh th this th this people who have this ability. And like how they, it just becomes a natural part of their expression. Um, hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, I, I also think like there are some moments, um, I think specifically um, there's this really short uh, bit where one of the Tanuki is tra transformed into a, 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 a Kitsune, into a fox to scare someone off. And the way that fox moves, like you, you, you can see... Uh, the uh the Asao Takahata that would go on to make uh, the tale of the princess kaguya there there's, there's this really yeah. sketchy fluidness to it very primal yeah. yeah and of course like the backgrounds are like absolutely gorgeous indeed they do as they usually do that's, that's kind of what these films are known for <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's also crazy consistent in that regard like even ocean waves had like wonderful incredible backgrounds is it the same dude who does it every time i'm trying to, i should look that up actually if it's the, uh, the same background so, on it. Interestingly enough, it's not always the same dude. It might be for this film. I've not looked it up. But uh, funny enough, whenever in the past we ask, oh, who did the background art? It was the same guy. So <laughs> <laughs> Every time we ask, it's the same guy. But when we don't... Exactly. Like, 
exactly. It's pretty good. Well, because it, that, that's usually when it's really good background mm -hmm. art. But I think in this film, this is not the case. Um, not oh, entirely sure, but... Actually, an, I another think. thing I wanted to mention, talk, speaking of uh, Isao Takahata and things like Kogan, uh, I, I think um, uh, th this film, uh, again, has uh, this through line of uh, Takahata's work, which is uh, storytelling as, a, as an element of his stories. Um, like you, you have only yesterday and like this story she tells about her childhood and the way it reflects um, uh, her present day. And uh, you have uh, Grave of the Fireflies with, um, which has this framing device of this, de uh, this ghost telling, uh, telling the story of, uh, of his life and death, uh, which goes into like a grander uh, theme of like the story of uh, like a, a story of the Japanese victimhood being told. Um, you, you have just like awoken me to the fact that Grave of the Fireflies is basically slow panning into the him dying freeze frame record scratch. Yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got here. Yeah. Well, uh, my point is that this it, it goes yeah. again here with uh, in Pompoko with uh, like mentioned before a few times like the documentary esque uh, narration over it uh and uh it, it it like being told as a like historic uh like thing happening um yeah. like an event uh, and how that ties into like uh folklore and how how the tales we tell about uh the places around us uh forms our relationships uh to those places yeah that's a really good observation of his style which obviously comes to a head in the the tale of the princess kaguya which is a straight up fairy tale and which is going to take us a while to get there. And still, because it's like the second to last film we're going to talk about, I think. Yeah, that's Studio Ghibli made. That is unless they come out with um, Miyazaki's uh, next film before then. Oh, that's true. I I, mean, I, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we need more material. Come on, Miyazaki. Yeah, fingers crossed. Can, can you make like a, a, a film every two months after we've uh, finished the series so we can have fresh content all the time? Yeah, exactly. That would be neat. Okay, so uh, one thing I think we, <laughs> uh, one term that we've so far danced around and avoided and not really said is, is communism. What? You're, you're a commie? Get out of here. That's our yeah. favorite one right now. <laughs> this is uh, YouTube.com and .com is, uh, is yeah, under com. US jurisdiction. C-O-M. <laughs> Didn't think about that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um. So it's, it's I like dot com, not dot communism. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Um, I like I like to say, uh, like as a pitch to my friends, like, do you want to see a film about communist tanuki beating up the police with their big ball sacks? And most people would be very confused, and some of them would share my sense of humor and say yes. That's basically how I went about it. So what some of them would be cowards version? and say they didn't want to see that, but then the truly yes. brave uh, watch this movie. Indeed. So how do you feel about the applicability of the communism as like a framework to understand the communal eco resistance? Well, I don't know. I, th I, th I think like um, it, it gets to like what, what's the... Um, I, th I think communism is uh, in a way uh, th this idea of this sort of return to a, a communal uh, living, but with um, modern uh, resources and knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. at, at, at the same time, there's this, um, th th there's this so sort of, um, Western centric, uh, Eurocentric, like, uh, idea that this sort of, uh, communalism is like, um, like, 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 like uh, primal and old, uh, and not something we can like turn something into, um, wh uh, w which, kind of complicates matters it, it's it's kind of hard to uh, to explain um but I, th I think it's related to how um uh, it, it's something that um a philosopher to uh talks about in his uh, video on uh climate grief and the um per, like like the, the political discussions of how one might structure a society uh to to uh avoid climate change and how um all these like big uh, philosophical ideas of how we're going to live and how the future is going to look. It's actually just like 
how many native peoples have like uh, been living or been trying to living for like centuries, uh, if not millennia, uh, and, and and like it kind you, you kind of ignore that element if you like talk about it in in those terms. So I think talking about these Tanuki as communist is sort of like ignoring how it's so much older than communism, what they're doing. Yeah, I agree mm. to that also. I feel like uh, people make uh, communism arguments about this movie. Uh, and the movie definitely, as we've talked, is definitely an anti-capitalist movie. It definitely has a lot of critiques of modernity and industrialized culture. But I think communism is too specific of a philosophy and like sense system of governance to really pigeonhole like the Tanukis into it because they could quite easily like reflect uh, because they do reflect the time of like feudalism almost going back like centuries into Japanese history which is a very similar kind of like community living so I don't know if the uh the comparison is just there yeah I I think I agree in, in most parts because obviously they do seem like a more feudal society to me like driven by more patriarchal like elders and uh, uh, the wise old men run this uh, run the city and like the military is run by like this very uh, aggressive uh, uh, young man all this kind of stuff like these structures are run by people in uh, certain positions of power depending on their um, 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 rank and their uh, basically age and legacy and stuff like that so it's obviously like not like that they are like a revolutionary committee they are kind of trying to fend for their space of life Um, what I think is kind of communist about it is obviously the in the same way that Takahara is a communist right that his analysis is inherently like slanted towards a communist frame at the world namely the two things which is a focus on community a focus on synergy between nature and technology which is very much a part of communist discourses despite the very technocratic uh, soviet union attempts at communism and also um the sort of awareness and criticism of the increasing commodification and the encroaching uh and and and, and damaging speed at which profit motive and uh capitalism grows uh, um destroys communities and uh yeah so, the, so it's pretty much natural like, resources yeah. uh, commun- communism is anti-capitalist but like all anti-capitalism isn't communism and uh, this isn't like uh th- th- this this isn't communist it's, it's just a meme to like throw out there like communist tanuki magic balls i mean uh, again i want to stress this i think the film is very communist in its analysis but the tanuki aren't well it's marxist isn't it like well, to, okay, okay, fair enough. What, 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 what's what, where's the difference there? I think like it isn't commun- communism is more like a system of government than it is a like philosophical framework. I mean, we shouldn't get lost in the weeds, but actually, it is both, and it's very hard to talk about this terminology without without invoking a ton of history about these terms. So let's uh, 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 probably uh, <laughs> put this uh, to the side for now. Um, the interesting thing I would just mention is that. Just very briefly, the terms have become very confusing in their different uses because obviously they have been used, as we're all aware, for horrible propaganda and horrible uh, systems of destruction and technocratic oppression before. This is kind of where the philosophical points that is actually making it less of a, a political system and more of a philosophy is kind of disappeared into the uh, unknown uh, depth and complexities of academia. <laughs> Right, so so we, yeah, okay. We should actually be careful of with throwing the, around the label, basically. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, uh, but it is very funny to imagine like the Tanuki uh, s- smashing up cops with their big balls and like big letters A C A B flashing. Yeah. For me, it's the one scene in which uh, he jumps on the front of a truck and then his ball sack kind of like just melts into a big sheet over the front of the truck. That's that's quite the imagery I want from a Ghibli film. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. Yeah. Good to know they got Junji Ito on art direction for this film. Wait, what was Junji Ito actually hired? No, I don't, no, I don't, no, I don't no, think no. so. <laughs> I, I mean... I, I wouldn't want to see what be, he does yeah. with Tanuki, though. I would read that. I mean, oh, well, yeah. we had the creative of Earthbound as a voice actor in one of the earlier, just like anything could be possible. I mean, anything <laughs> goes. Yeah, that's it's, true. It's Ghibli. Like. <laughs> you never know whom they get get on board. Yeah, and like, 
a lot of the like weird transformations in imagery is like but like obviously it's um most of the like if not every single transformation is just like a direct uh, uh allusion or reference to uh cultural uh, iconography which is like honestly like pretty alien to us and like it's one of it's one of the limitations of uh this uh podcast is like we aren't japanese yeah we don't have the japanese here yeah yeah you'd also probably need to spend like five hours podcasting to nail down like every single reference in this film just due to like the sheer depth of like every scene oh, yeah. in its yeah. uh, and honestly referencing. we couldn't be asked yeah that is true it would have been pretty well, hard I mean, yeah absolutely someone else do it the, yeah, the would please. require like years of studying like japanese ethno ethnographic like history and anthropological studies and uh, we need thunder for that <laughs> maybe what we actually need is just the director's commentary uh blu-ray if it, that exists yeah <laughs> exactly okay. that might actually how would, be even, <laughs> how would that even go like two subtitle tracks going at the same time that was oh. weird <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you talking about just watch the dub oh no <laughs> raccoon pouches no oh, oh. oh don't watch the dub not this time it's not <laughs> well, yeah it's not terribly good translation it does have clancy brown in it though I think that's um, also what makes this film uh, valuable, even like in the context of the uh, uh, Ghibli movies, which like it's far from like uh, like very far from my favorite Ghibli films. But I, I I still think it's it's valuable in its uh, like decidedly uh, Japanese and ki- and kind of like r- radical uh, like stance and structure. Uh, like it's it's uh, it, it, it's so unconventional and so unlike uh, the other uh, uh, Ghibli films. Yeah, it's uh, so unlike so basically any other anime movie I can even think of. Like the again, like the faux documentary structure, the constant like breaks of fourth wall, and like weird um, sense of like historical storytelling as opposed to a a, a discreet like character based narrative. Yeah. Hmm. It's it's definitely like like um, it, it, it's it's what one of the reasons why I I, I find like comparing uh ghibli to to like disney is like okay it's sort of good shorthand for people who aren't aware of studio ghibli to say oh they're like the japanese disney like like they're, they're that big uh but but like it's also like imagine like D- disney making a like animated film filled with like talking animals but it was like about the american depression and like half of them died yeah. by the end like what how do you they couldn't get away with that shit yeah no <laughs> they, they absolutely yeah, bambi is as close as we'll get and, and that's like <laughs> uh, that's why that like this, this movie kind of uh, sticks with me is that like, this um juxtaposition between that um that animated like joy and goofiness and all these party scenes and fun transformations um and then like all this death and decay and like the destruction of a like uh of a people well and animals but like a, a people's homeland and way of life just like d- disappearing before their eyes and the only thing remaining is uh a, a yearning memory uh and like a, a, a lot of like dead spirits like partying on in a boat somewhere it's just well, by the way by the way Did they we also drown? let go it is also mono no aware right oh yeah mono yes no aware we need to mention it fuck. every episode it is mm-hmm. mono no aware again yeah yeah if uh, you can now fill that out on your bingo sheets yeah mono no aware yes fuck <laughs> just yeah. wanted to get that out there Very juvenile, <laughs> mono no aware. Yeah. I mean, yeah, but it's, it's still everything is there. Like this, 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 this ephemerality of the culture of the fading. Like a lo- the idea of the boat alone would be enough to make a case for this mono mm-hmm. aware aspect. But yeah. literally everything is about the past haunting the present in a sort of nostalgic mode where you need to let go of the past. Yeah, and that's where we get that. That's that's why that that scene where they're like chanting, n- not. Uh, and like it's it's this big climactic moment where they pull out all the stops and like the background and the animation like becomes one in like this really impressive sequence um but th- there's not really that much at stake at that point like the, the battle is over all, all they have left is like this remembrance and and that's the big climactic moment because like they don't get uh like 
a, a sort of victory. Like following yeah. this, there's just this denouement of um, everything calming down uh, and the Tanuki just going their separate ways and either like assimilating or fleeing. And then this gentle reminder that like, hey, so whenever like people talk about like the raccoon population going away that's kind of weird isn't it like we, we, we don't like just disappear we we move places and die just just think about that goodbye mm-hmm. and that's the end of the movie what a fucking what a fucking great film what yeah <laughs> it's wonderful doesn't give a absolutely shit absolutely wonderful <laughs> oh wow all right if it does this then i would say Thanks for listening to the Narcicast. Uh, also check out our Discord server if you want to, you know, hit us up, discuss the film, anything else. Uh, and consider supporting our mic quality by giving us money on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Narcicast. Links are also in the description. I hope you had a good one. We'll see each other. I guess we'll see each other very shortly because in about two, three weeks, we're going to do a quick one on On Your Mark, which is the first, like, I guess, short film we're going to cover or music video (laughs) that would be the better term here so see you all then and uh goodbye bye bye remember anti capitalism takes balls yeah big big balls big tanuki balls